Well, thank you for the invitation to come here to, uh, to Dublin. Wales, of course, is a, a direct neighbour of Ireland, not in terms of being a land neighbour, but of course a neighbour by sea. Another Celtic country, although we, of course, are Brythonic Celts as opposed to the, uh, the Gaelic Celts, the Q Celts of Ireland and, and Scotland. But nevertheless, we know we have very much a shared uh, culture, even to the extent, as you know, that uh, your patron saint was a Welshman who was uh, kidnapped, it is said, from the shores of Wales. Our patron saint, though born and brought up in Wales, St David, was, it is said, a first language Irish speaker because he grew up in a part of Wales that until the 10th century had Irish as its main language. And so the links go back uh, many, many hundreds of years. It's a special pleasure to visit at a time when, as the Taoiseach told us at the British Irish Council a fortnight ago, Ireland is now emerging from the serious economic difficulties that it has faced and the Troika will soon be leaving these shores. The courage and the fortitude that the people of Ireland have demonstrated through this extraordinarily difficult period of time, let's face it, does reflect, I believe, the strength and solidarity that exists in Irish society. And that's a lesson indeed for all of us. And your recovery has significant practical implications for us in Wales. Ireland is our second largest trading partner after the USA. In 2012, our exports to Ireland were worth more than double those to Germany, for example, which is our next largest market. So we take particular pleasure as you move forward again after such a difficult time. And let's face it, it's not been easy for us either. But certainly uh, we hope that the benefits uh, will be mutual as we th see things improving in the future. Now, you've asked me to speak about the future of Wales in a changing UK. Now, the first and obvious point to make is that the future of Wales will indeed lie within the UK. The UK is a strange state in the sense that there are very few states in the world where if you ask somebody what their nationality is, they will not give as their first answer the nationality of the state. If you ask most people in Wales what their nationality is, they will tell you they're Welsh. People in England will say they're English, Scotland, Scottish. For most people, they see no difficulty in holding a second uh, dual identity, that is, of being British. It's quite clear to us that we are at a financial advantage by being part of the UK. We don't have oil, and so we can't make an argument that somehow we would be better off outside the UK. We do not have a history where, which has generated an enormous sense of grievance and oppression, and therefore that driving factor isn't there either in terms of independence. Independence is supported by around about 10 to 15% of the population. But what we have noticed over the years is that demand for devolution and more of it has grown very, very strongly. If you look at opinion polls now, the percentage of the population who would do away with devolution is around about 10%. The percentage of the population who want to see substantial devolution, including for, of course, areas like the criminal justice system, is well over half of the, um, the population in Wales in terms of the opinion polls. And the point that I would make as far as Wales is concerned is that we are able to satisfy our national aspirations by being part of the UK. We can have a devolved government control over our domestic affairs. Uh, we are able to uh, support our language. We're able to support our economy, our health service, uh, education. We can have our own football team and rugby team, which the Catalans, I know, would die for, and yet enjoy the fiscal and monetary umbrella that the UK provides. Now, I can say with confidence that following the announcements uh, a week or so ago, setting out the UK government's proposals for new and very significant fiscal devolution to Wales, that we look forward to seeing further devolution in the future. Now, those proposals are a response to the first report of the Commission on Devolution in Wales, or the Silk Commission, as it's known, not because of the dress sense of the members, but because the chairman was Sir Paul Silk. The recommendations of the Commission offer us the prospect both of new tax powers and significantly borrowing powers that will enable us to make significant investment in our new infrastructure, particularly perhaps in our major roads. And those in this audience who travel uh, to Wales via Fishguard or Holyhead may be particularly interested to hear about that. It builds, of course, on the significant devolution that took place in 2011, where we are, of course, now a primary uh, lawmaking legislature. I have to admit that the path to the UK government's announcement has been, shall we say, indirect. The announcement itself appeared one day short of a year after the Commission reported. 
Uh, that followed a period of intensive lobbying, not only by the Welsh Government, but also, and very importantly, by business leaders and by other stakeholders, building on a strong political consensus across the Assembly. In the end, the UK Government acknowledged the force of our arguments, as Churchill commented on hearing that the Americans, this is Churchill who said, it's not me, had joined the Allies in the Second World War. You can always rely on them to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the alternatives. So it appears to have been uh, that attitude that the UK government adopted with regard to the Silk Commission. But we got there in the end. And devolution has shown itself to be a sufficiently flexible constitutional model to accommodate the legitimate aspirations of Wales. As we look forward now to the legislation that will implement uh, Silk, that the UK government has promised will be brought uh, in the lifetime of this current UK parliament, uh, that will mean then that the new powers should begin to accrue to Wales from 2017. Now that message about the capacity of devolution to accommodate national aspirations is one I took to Scotland in a speech I made in Edinburgh last week. So let me turn to Scotland because if the UK is indeed changing, a major cause of that change is the constitutional debate in Scotland. Now, devolution, I'd suggest, is basically a variant of federalism. The UK is in reality a quasi-federal state, and it will continue to move in that direction. Our deputy presiding officer in the Assembly put it recently in this way, it is federalism without the rule book. So the choice being put by uh, Alex Hammond, my colleagues, First Minister in Scotland, to the people of Scotland is essentially one of devolution, quasi-federalism within the UK or quasi-independence outside of it. I describe the latter option as quasi-independence because the terms that are being proposed of independence in Scotland include a currency union with what would then be the UK. They also seem to include a system where uh, subsidies would continue to flow to Scottish renewable energy projects from consumers elsewhere on the island, uh, which is not something that is a particularly attractive option uh, for those outside Scotland. But... I think it's probably true to say that, particularly with a currency union, that that would constrain very strongly the ability of any Scottish government in the future to adopt its own course of, ac of action with regard to the Scottish economy. Now, I hope that the people of Scotland will choose the quasi-federal option within the UK, as Wales is doing, and I made that case in Edinburgh last week. But what happens if Scotland does indeed decide to stay within the UK? The UK cannot stay as it is. It just cannot do it. It's clear that there's scope for further development of Scottish devolution. The choice for Scotland cannot be one between independence on the one hand and the status quo on the other. Rather, in my view, it's between quasi-independence on the one hand and new powers, probably significant fiscal powers, uh, sometimes described as Devo Max, sometimes in a different bundle of powers described as Devo Plus for Scotland within the UK family of nations. Now, whether that arrangement is termed Devo Max, Home Rule, or whatever, that's the route that I hope that they will take. And I'm confident that the flexibility of devolution will allow it to happen. What does it mean, though, for the UK if the Scots remain in the UK? What does it mean for Wales's? place in the UK. And here I'd want to make three points. As far as Wales is concerned, the devolution of powers is far from over. That is a process that will continue in the future. The Silk Commission is now examining the powers of the National Assembly and the Welsh Government has submitted evidence calling for a fundamental reworking of Welsh devolution. That evidence uh, is supported by Welsh public opinion according to the opinion polls. And I'm optimistic that next spring the Commission will come forward with a report proposing a significant extension of the Assembly's and the Welsh Government's powers. If that is so, that report will feed into the constitutional debate which will follow the outcome of the Scottish referendum. If the Scots vote to stay in the UK, consideration of new powers for Scotland will need to take place in parallel with assessment of whatever new proposals the Silk Commission brings forward for Wales. Devolution of power is not just about Scotland. It involves all the constituent parts of the UK, including, for that matter, England, which I'll return to in a moment. Now, that takes me to my second point. I've argued for, and I repeat this argument here today, the need for 
devolution issues, including the status of England within the UK, to be addressed holistically. We need a UK-wide perspective rather than dealing on a bilateral basis which, with each of Wales and Scotland and indeed Northern Ireland. So I've called for the creation of a UK constitutional convention to address the territorial constitution of the UK, the governance of each of its parts and their relationship to one another. We have a unique opportunity after the referendum to consider those fundamental questions and it's one of course that we should seize. My third point is that the process should aim to secure a stable constitutional framework for the UK based on respects for the devolved legislatures as a permanent feature of our constitutional arrangements. There has to be a consistency in the way powers for the devolved bodies are conferred and defined in law, even if the actual powers might vary for each nation according to their particular circumstances. There should be a presumption in favour of devolution. Powers should only remain at the centre if it's strictly necessary for them to do so. And indeed, if you look at the responsibility, the direct responsibilities that the UK government actually has across the whole of the UK, they're actually very small indeed. Defence immigration, uh, issues of uh, dealing with uh, security, very little else actually that's actually done by UK government across the whole of the UK in the same way. It tends to be dealing with external issues and internal security. Driver and vehicle licensing devolved in Northern Ireland. Social security devolved in Northern Ireland. Health devolved everywhere. Education devolved everywhere. So in fact the major tools of government are already in the hands of the devolved administrations. It's a question of formalising a process that is already in place. Despite that, of course, it is a big agenda. A particular problem is undoubtedly how is England to be governed in the new constitutional world. The problem arises because the particular form of devolution we've adopted in the UK reflects strongly held feelings of national identity in both Scotland and Wales. The logical consequence would be to recognise English identity in the UK's constitutional arrangements. But for most people, the creation of an English Parliament alongside the Scottish Parliament and the National Assembly would unbalance or imperil the Union. It's not much of an issue in England. They don't see it as an issue at the moment. But the way forward might be some form of special recognition of English concerns at Westminster, perhaps alongside the creation of a reformed second chamber with weighted representation from each part of the UK, together with significant transfers of power away from Whitehall to the large city regions uh, throughout England itself. And of course, looming behind all this is the question of the UK's relationship to Europe. I know it's a matter of considerable concern to Ireland, facing theoretically the possibility of membership of the European Union without the UK as a member. That's not a situation Ireland will want or indeed should need to face. But for my present purposes, the nightmare scenario would be one in which the UK, based on strong Euroscepticism in England, votes to leave the EU, but in Wales and Scotland, people vote to stay. That creates a real problem in terms of how we deal with that problem across the whole of the UK. There would be unpredictable constitutional implications for the future of the UK. It's a situation we must avoid. And I stand here before you this afternoon as an unapologetic Europhile. I do not agree with the insularity and nationalism that drives uh, the debate in the UK on occasions in terms of its relationship with Europe. Uh, it is absolutely crucial for us in Wales uh, that we continue to be members of the European Union. Uh, we receive, we have received £1.9 billion uh, in the last tranche of European money through structural funds. Uh, the EU accepts more than 40% of our exports. We have companies based in Wales, large companies that I have no doubt would leave <coughs> if the UK were to leave the EU and they would go closer to where their market actually is, namely the EU rather than the UK on its own. And that is an argument that I believe all politicians in the UK need to start making rather than trying to run away from it and pretend it isn't happening. It is absolutely crucial that people in the UK understand the benefits of the UK's membership of the EU. It's particularly true in Wales, where there is no question whatsoever on any form of counting that we benefit financially from our membership of the EU. So how do we conclude? 
Well, in summary, uh, my answer to your question is, there's not much of a summary, but I'll try. Yes, the UK is changing. And yes, there are significant, indeed possibly existential challenges ahead. Wales has to play its part, a very active part in the coming debates, and I'm sure we will as a committed member of the UK family of nations. But in doing so, we won't forget to look outwards too. We're committed to maintaining our close and friendly links with Ireland, not just through marriage, but also through our representative here, Cheryl, Cheryl Dennis, who is uh, hosted in the UK Embassy in Dublin. I hope in due time uh, that Ireland will be able to reopen its consulate in Cardiff, something that we very much uh, appreciated. I know it was a victim of the economic crisis, but it was uh, immensely in Ireland's interest to have a full-time consul uh, in Cardiff. There's no doubt about that. The influence that the Irish government was able to, to have uh, was uh, very, very strong. I understand the reasons why it happened, but I do hope, and I know there are some in the audience who have heard me say this before, but I do hope that the time will come in the future uh, when the Irish government can have permanent representation in our capital. Thank you for the kind invitation uh, to speak here today. I hope that what I've said has cast some light on these complex, in, in some ways, you know, worrying, but fascinating issues. I